a series, and normally I stand, but I'm going to set today because I was on an airplane for about 24 hours straight and travel, and so, um, you know, if you see me looking like I'm drifting off while I'm speaking, it's because my body is telling me that it's getting close to evening time, time to go to bed, but we're going to get through it today. But we've been on a series called Heroes, and the tagline for that series is we've talked about ordinary people extraordinary God. But I want to add something else to that today. I believe that ordinary people can do extraordinary things because we live for and we serve an extraordinary God. And I like to use the phrase that God can infuse our life with his life and cause us to live a God-sized life, a God-sized life experience. And what we did two weeks ago is we talked about the main trait of those that are heroic and those that are known as heroes in our culture and our life. And we talked about the need for courage. And we talked about our need for courage to overcome the things that intimidate us. And we mentioned three of them. We talked about many of us struggle with uh, fears of inadequacies. And in that, we just said, God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. And so we cannot allow ourselves to be intimidated from engaging in God's will and God's purpose. We just need to surrender to him and saying, God, uh, I do not within the realm of my abilities or my talents and my skills to do what you've asked me to do. But when God takes an ordinary life and puts his anointing and grace upon it, we surrender to God God can do extraordinary things. We also talked about us overcoming the fear of man, which deals with the issues of rejection and misunderstanding. The Bible says the fear of man is a snare to us. I believe it's one of the singular most uh, important strongholds that you and I and all of us wrestle against, that we need to see God pulled down in our life, that we don't live for men and men's opinions, favorable opinions of us, but we live our life before an audience of one. And we want to live it before God without the fear of man. The last fear that we talked about is overcoming the fear of failure. And we just said that all of us have failed in times past. And those failures can intimidate us to try to start again. And some of us have said, no, I tried and I failed and, and that was enough. That was embarrassing That traumatized me. I'm not going to try to attempt to start all over again. And we talked about Joshua and God causing the uh, the sun to stand still for him and how that that is a picture, prophetic picture to any and all of us who need more time in our life to get accomplished with what God wants to do in our life. God can redeem the time and that he can give us more time in life to do what he's asked us to do. And that's just kind of where we've been. I know that James talked about Samson and Samson being a fallen hero. And again, that is a lesson, a life lesson to us to, that you may have had a great calling on your life and in your failure felt like, well, obviously I've disqualified myself, but God can take the end of your life and make it greater than the beginning of your life. And so today what we want to talk about is we want to talk about extraordinary worship an extravagant thanksgiving. And we want to use uh, the passage of Scripture out of Luke chapter 7 to talk about that a little, and we're going to read it in just a few moments. But today, I really want to invite all of us as springs of life to accept the call that I believe is upon us to not just be courageous in our obedience, but to also be courageous in our worship And that God can infuse us in the everyday simplicity of our life. And, and, you know, we have a lot of things that help facilitate worship in our times and our culture. And it it makes worship easier in some ways because I can throw on a DVD. I can throw on a CD. I can uh, come into this environment this morning and, and there are gifted musicians and gifted singers and it just helps take you someplace that many times we couldn't get there by ourselves. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. And so you can throw on a CD and, and you can have 
top drawer, A number one type worship. And it's just easy to worship God in those environments. And I'm just talking about in engaging our, our song before the Lord and engaging our heart before the Lord. But how many of you know that true worship, if we want to define true worship, what it is, true worship is never easy. I don't care if you have the best of the best CDs. I don't care if you have the best DVDs of the best worship conferences from the best worship genres that are out there in our day. True worship is never easy. It's always a costly act. Because worship is not about somebody else doing something for you and you observing it and you're, you're, you're moved by it or entertained by it. But it is something that is very personal. On a very personal, on a very individual level, there is this engagement of the Spirit of God upon our lives and us responding to Him in, in a way in which He is he's pulling my heart out towards Him. And I begin to, in ever-increasing degrees, give God more of myself to Him. To where literally what I am living out is a Romans 12 reality where I'm presenting myself as a living sacrifice unto God. And it's not about 20 minutes, a half hour on a Sunday morning. It's every day, all day, that I am, a, I am an offering unto God. That in my thoughts and in my words and in the attitude and the expression of my heart, and my life, even physically, what I do with my body, that I become a lover of God. That's how I define my life. I become a lover of God that loves God with every facet of my being. I become a lover of God with every, every fiber of my being. I become a lover of God. That's how I define my life. I am a lover of God, and everything about my life is to give God more love because I am reciprocating back to Him what He's given to me. And so, today I want to call us to be a people of courageous worship and extraordinary thanks. Because I believe that just as God is calling us to, to overcome certain fears of inadequacy and, and rejection and misunderstanding and the fear of failure and all the things that, that make us aware of self and getting through the veil of self to where God can say, would you simply allow me to use you? That's what that, that battlefield in our mind of overcoming our fields one of these things that God, will, arenas that God wants us also to be courageous in is to be courageous in our worship and learn to be a person that loves God with everything that is within us. And we begin to be a people of extraordinary, uncommon worship and extraordinary thanks. And it is never easy. It will always be a costly act. True worship is really the full measure of our devotion and it requires the deepest acts of surrender and sacrifice. And so many times what I see the body of Christ doing is, is we set minimum levels of what we're willing to give to God. And in your relationship with God, God is always asking more from you, not less. And God is willing to receive and accept what you're able by faith to give him. But you need to understand, just as uh, in our relationships around our family and our marriages and our, and our relationship with our children, I thank God that our love does not remain the same. That it's, a, it's an ever-growing odyssey of us learning to love in a, in a more skilled way, in a greater way. And that we have deeper levels of affection and that that we're giving God more of our emotion, range of our emotional capabilities, that I'm giving more of, of learning how to, to love people effectively. Well, worship is the same way. And so sometimes what we do is we set minimums and we go, okay, that's what I'm willing to give God now. And God is willing to accept that for the moment. But His engagement of you, He will continue to draw you into a deeper level of intimacy with him. And it's amazing what he will do in our, our walk with him and in the processes that he takes us through. And sometimes we're saying, God, why is this happening? Why am I going through this? It's because God is squeezing out of you 
something of what he's longed for. And it's not that God needs more from you. No, it's because God longs and desires and wants more from you because he knows that in that act of surrender, in that costly offering, in that moment of surrender, there is this moment where transformation can happen. It's about you needing what God has to give you in this moment of intimacy and worship. That leaves us transformed by the experience. Now in Luke 7, verse 37 and 39, and whenever God uh, gives us something in the Scripture, and that story is repeated throughout Scripture, and I want you to know this passage of Scripture is not without controversy because it's, it's in all of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and some people would say it's, it's one experience, and then there's other scholars that say, really, it's, it's two different events, that some of the Gospels record one event, and then some of the Gospels record another event. I was studying while I was in Cambodia, and I had internet, and I was reading uh, some brothers that had written on this, and some of them say it's the same person, but at two different periods of time. There was an early moment of offering worship to the Lord, and then there was a later moment, but it was the same person. And some people would say it's two people. And so I'm going to say, as you look at all four passages, you may say, you know, same experience as far as the act of worship, but two different time periods, two different events. And I have an opinion, and I'm not going to give you what that opinion is. I'm going to let you be a student of Scripture, and I want you to wrestle with that But I want to focus in on this one in Luke chapter 7. And this is a picture of a woman who is a woman of the world. And she was a known sinner. And uh, by using the phrase in Luke 7 that she was a known sinner, uh, that was an obvious statement to saying that she was someone that was sexually immoral. In other words, they were saying that she was an adulterer or possibly she was living a life of, of prostitution. But I want us to look and read this uh, passage of Scripture. And I'm going to start with verse 36. And it says, And one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, and when she learned that she was... when, When she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster flask of ointment and standing behind him at his feet, weeping... She began to wet his feet with her tears, wiped them with the hair of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner." Now, Luke 7 tells the remarkable story of a woman who does something that is extraordinary. She takes common actions, and there were customs that people, uh, as far as customs of hospitality, that accompanied when you invited somebody in the home, where there was a customary washing of the feet. Either you provided a basin and water, and you allowed them to wash their feet, or if you were uh, wealthy enough where you had a servant where you could employ somebody to do it, they would wash your guest's feet. Everybody would have your head anointed because unlike us, they didn't shower every day in that country. And so (laughs) you needed a little anointing from time to time on your head. Uh, I've told you the story the first time I went to Nigeria, Africa, Uh, I was in a meeting, and there was probably about 1,000 to 1,200 people in the church service. And African services are known and notorious to go like four, three, four hours. And I mean, they are exuberant worshipers, and that includes dancing and motion and movement. And and, uh, they even take the offering by dancing down to the offering plate. I'm glad some of you like that. We may want to try it sometime. (laughs) But they know how to shake it. I'll put it that way. Uh, they, they love to dance. They love to sway. They love to clap. They love to swing. And, 
And because many of them do not bathe every day or shower every day, simply because of the limitation of not having an ability to do so, they use a lot of perfumes and fragrances. And I will never, ever forget being escorted into that meeting after they had been worshiping for about two hours. And you had this mixture of body odor and all of these colognes and perfumes. And uh, I can remember I got kind of nauseous. (laughs) <laughs> and, uh, and so while they, were, while they had escorted me in, I tried to stay by this window. Uh, and I was on the platform, but I didn't want it to be that obvious. And I just kept on leaning towards the, the window, trying to keep fresh air in. But that's the way they do it, because that's the way it has to be done. One of the customs of hospitality is that you would have your head anointed with a fragrant oil. And so it allowed everybody in a common room sitting together around to eat. Somebody, instead of them smelling your greasy head, they could smell a nice fragrant aroma that you would be emitting. Your feet would be washed. But also the Jewish people, it was their custom that everyone would be greeted with a kiss. Uh, That was also a shocking thing on the mission field. I went to Argentina, and in Argentina they have a custom that is based on some of the European customs, and and I was not used to having men come up and kiss me. <laughs> but I'll never forget uh, the first time this elderly gentleman who had been paralyzed for many years and God had, had healed him. And he, his story was notorious throughout the town because he had been paralyzed for so many years. He became the greeter of this church because God had healed him and restored him. And he just exuded the love of God. But what he would do is he would kiss you, and he would kiss you kind of off-center on the mouth. And he would just bury his nose and his lips on your face. And he would just kind of plant it and hold it there, and he would love you. And they would always say, Dios le bendiga, God bless you. And uh, so, as a man, I had to get used to that. Well, in Jewish customs of hospitality... They would always greet each other with a kiss. And maybe it was on the cheek. I don't know. But the Bible does say in many of the letters of Paul, greet each other, brethren, with a holy kiss. I had the opportunity of uh, participating in a funeral with a couple in our church that they had been former Mennonites. And they lost a daughter tragically in a drowning accident. And so we hosted... Uh, hundreds of Mennonite families that came in there to also to, to grieve with Victor and Maria Kaufman in that funeral. And I, I did not know that the Mennonite custom was also to uh, greet each other with a kiss. And I watched some of the teenage boys as they had to do this customary greeting. It reminded me of watching one of those nature shows where two rams come and they butt their heads together. I mean, there was a force of coming together and an equal force of being repelled apart. Uh, but you could tell those, those teenage boys were saying, we do this because we're Mennonite, but we don't like it one bit. But in the midst of all of this ordinary dinner, this ordinary customs of hospitality, the anointing of oil, the washing of the feet, the kissing, there was something that went from ordinary customs And the simple things that we do every day in our life when we entertain and show hospitality is something where it became a God-sized moment and it becomes something of extraordinary worship. And I may repeat this a couple times because I want you to get it. And I know I'm not pacing back and forth today because I don't have the legs to do it. But I want you to hear this. This woman took these ordinary, everyday things that people do in life and she infused them with a devotion and a passion and she tipped the scale of them from the ordinary to where they went to extraordinary. She she redeemed them from the mundane. She redeemed them from things that were just customary, traditional, ritualistic motions that really are the meaning of them have been forgotten. But in that moment of time, God allowed her to exhibit an uncommon worship. And in the other Gospels, Jesus said this. 
He said, every time the gospel is preached, this woman's worship will be remembered for all time throughout the world. Which tells me that if you and I can get this as a people, if we can get this as a church, and, and there are some very common things that we do every Sunday about our worship that we would say they have, there's a commonality to them. There is a simplicity about them. We're going we're gonna to sing songs and we're going to clap our hands. We're going to raise our hands and we're going to worship God in these ways. And there's going to be some things that we're going to say it's going to be no different from Sunday to Sunday. The difference is going to be our hearts in response to God. Some of the externals may not change, but the level of passion, the level of devotion, the level of connection, the level of engagement with God can radically change if we will be courageous worshipers. Now Jesus said, this woman's worship, it's going to be a memorial for all time. God says, she will never be forgotten in how she worshiped me that day. It will be remembered for all times. Matter of fact, it's going to be part and parcel of the very fabric of the message of the gospel. Because the response to the gospel is worship. You cannot hear the message of grace. You cannot have a revelation of the grace of God. You cannot have a revelation of the forgiveness that comes by God's unmerited favor towards you without it soliciting something from our heart where we give thanks to God for all that he has done in our lives. Where his grace, as we remember it, becomes amazing in our lives over and over again. But what made this common dinner, this this. This, these rituals of hospitality, what made it so extraordinary? What turned it into a worship service? Well, I believe that our perspective determines our worship. I'm going to say that again. Our perspective determines our worship. It's how we see things in the moment when we're experiencing it. This means to me that I've got to always ask God all the time. It has to be a constant prayer that I'm asking God. God, let me see things the way you see them. Every day, every moment of the day, because I can become so familiar and and my life is predictable that I can just kind of set the cruise, as it were, and I can not see that God is at work around my life. I can fail to see how he's wanting to interface and interact with me. And so to me, perspective ultimately determines what our worship experience is going to be like. Whether it's going to be mundane, whether it's going to be something that's external and ritualistic, or whether it's going to be something where the Spirit of God interacts with me and I'm changed by the glory of that moment. Jesus in the Beatitudes, he said, blessed are those that what? Blessed are those, the one where he said, you shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That's why we should have this constant prayer. God, let me see things the way you see them. Let the things that would cloud my vision, let the things that would would, uh, cloak your activity and and, and the, what would hide your face from me, let my heart become pure still to where I'm seeing you in everything, in every way around me. That's what sustains you when you're on the mission field. Because uh, some of you are going to hear the tale of two uh, missions trips. And one of them was very cutting edge and and it was going across an illegal border and distributing Bibles and getting the Bible to the underground church. And, you know, I like that. It's kind of like special operations, you know, get your adrenaline going. And you're praying, God, just don't let them see things that they shouldn't see. Uh, but to be honest with you, some of you are saying, well, did you see awesome things in Cambodia? Yes, I did. What, what awesome things did you see? I saw the Cambodian people. Well, I mean, did you, did, you, 
Did you see, what were you seeing? What were you, what were you seeing God do? Well, I was seeing God reveal his father heart to orphans. But to be honest with you, I spent a week with my brother Randy, and we just sweated, uh, <laughs> we just sweated it out. We were, we were building a security fence, and it was about rebar and concrete and temperatures that felt like 100 degrees. There's nothing sexy about that. But what you have to do is you have to connect the mission with a vision of something that is larger than a bucket of concrete. It's got to be larger than a column of rebar. It's got to be larger than just saying we've got to mix more mud. We've got to nail the forms together. No, what you have to do is you have to see things through the eyes of the Lord. And in the midst of the work, you have to slow down and say, God, slow the game down enough for me where I'm not in the midst of my misery where I feel like every part of me in my clothing and my shoes and everything is wet and filled with sweat. And really every step becomes more difficult because you feel exhausted because I tell you what, in just less than two hours, you would show up and, and it would just exhaust you in the work. And so you carrying everything was like in slow motion. As you just get it out. But in the midst of that, I had to say, what is it, God, that you're doing and you're saying to my brothers that are working and experiencing this ordeal with me? What are you, what are you doing in the life of these kids? What are, you, what are you doing in the life of the pastors and the leaders here? What does this look like for them from their perspective? I watched as this Cambodian pastor when we were in church with him that Sunday. And I was just thanking God that we had a Sunday morning to just sit there and to rest a little bit. And they didn't even have a translator. But he was reading, we, we knew the text that he had chosen because one of the guys that was an American on the mission field there, he, he said, these are the two texts that he's chosen. But in a moment, even though he was talking to us in the Khmer language, and he was passionately sharing, all of a sudden his voice began to crack and tears began to well up in his eyes. And so afterwards I said, tell me what it was that made him emotional because you could feel the moment and you could feel this, this gratitude that was coming from his heart. And again, we need to understand that in that culture, because basically they have Buddhist traditions and foundations, everybody is living out their karma. And so if kids are abandoned or kids are orphaned, it was because they did something in a past life that they deserved this. And so he said, we, you need to understand when, when people come from around the world and this type of love is lavished upon these orphans, and people from around the world come to help make them safe and to make sure that they have a home and, and they're cared for and they get their teeth done and, and there are gifts that are given to them. It is making a statement to this doctrine of demons that tries to destroy the dignity of people's worth. And so he was just saying, and, and I found this out afterwards, that this pastor had also gone through the orphan home himself. And that now he is this pastor that is now communicating the love of God and he's preaching the love of God and he's revealing the love of God. But firsthand he knows what it is because he was an orphan himself and he was communicating to all of us thanks for us being able to come and what it means to these orphans to have people come from around the world that God would love them to send them someone from thousands of miles away to tell them that they are loved, and that their life has worth and meaning. I was telling the Olsons this morning, and um, we were just talking about some of the things that happened there, and you have to be very careful in how much emotion that you express to them because they kind of mirror the emotion that you have. So we were warned before getting off the bus. They said, as you say the goodbyes today, try to manage your emotions because... If they see you crying, all these kids will start crying as well. And so they said, if you can manage your emotions, wait till you get back on the bus. 
well, you know, it's hard to do. So you're trying to manage your emotions. But this one young man that I worked with all week, he came up to me and he said, don't forget me. Remember me. Remember me. He said it to me twice. Remember me. And I told him, I said, and he knew enough English to get what I said. I said, I will never forget you. I will never forget. You're all, I said, you'll always be in my heart. Well, that's what God was doing. Yeah. <laughs> and I was, I was glad to be a part of that in the midst of the concrete, the rebar, in the midst of, of all of the, the intensity of labor and the fatigue that came with that. There was this thing about God is at work in this moment of time revealing his love to his people. Okay, I got to get back on track. Our perspective is going to determine our worship. So what was your perspective when you walked in this morning? Was it to simply go through the motions of this service, knowing maybe what the service was going to look like? Or did you respond to God with something that you knew God was asking of you and from you, and were you willing to surrender to Him in a greater degree? To where this ordinary meeting could turn into something that is extraordinary. This woman was a known sinner. And she takes this ordinary dinner and it turns into this extraordinary worship. These ordinary common gestures became extraordinary because of her perspective in that moment. We must always understand when we get here every Sunday, and, and I know I'm focusing on church on Sunday because it's our corporate gathering. But I want us to always prime the pump of our heart and always remember what God has done for us. What did he save you from? What have you been forgiven of? What have you been saved for? Not just saved from, but saved for. And so things go from customary to extraordinary. And so what she did in this moment was she noticed that the customary things that are done to a guest was not done to Jesus. And we're going to explain why in just a moment. She saw that nobody washed Jesus' feet or not even a basin of water was provided for Jesus to wash his feet. There was no anointing on his head. And in this moment, this woman that was a known sinner, but her heart is just overwhelmed by the grace of God. In this passage of Scripture, Jesus confirms his forgiveness for her. But I do not believe that this was the only interaction that Jesus had with this woman. There, there was something that led to this moment of how she got into the dinner and maybe she wasn't even on the guest list, but she, she got there. And when I was studying this, I noticed that the people that are the most desperate in the Bible have the greatest encounters with God. I mean, the woman who has the issues of blood, the issue of blood, and everybody's pressing in and pressing on Jesus uh, to receive healing. And, 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 but somehow in the middle of the crowd, she's on the ground and she, she positioned herself where when he walks by, she's just going to grab him. She's going to lay a hold of his garment and she's going to get something from him. You see it all the way through Gospels that the ones that are, are, are God moves on their behalf are these people that are in these desperate situations. There is, there is this thing where all of what would say is normal decorum and respectability, it's, it's gone because they see a greater vision. And so the things that we would say, play it safe or stay in the comfort zone or, 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 or make sure that you just keep it in the bounds of what is normal here. This woman, and it says, and we get pictures many times, images of the woman uh, that is anointing the feet of Jesus. And it shows her at the feet of Jesus and Jesus looking down. This passage of scripture says she didn't come to the face or the front of Jesus 
She, I mean, Jesus was, the table was in front of Jesus. Jesus was reclined at the table. She comes from Jesus from the back. So I want you to get the imagery of the picture of her sneaking in there. And when she sees that nothing has been done in a customary manner to show him hospitality, she is undone by how he has been treated. And so she has this costly ointment. And what she does is she doesn't just anoint his head. No, the Bible tells us in the other passages, it says that she broke the bottle. And there's a lot of implications when it says she broke the bottle. That meant that she was saying, I do not want to just give him some. I want to give him all of this. That in this moment, I realize that he is the only one that is worthy of this type of offering. This type of devotion. This type of worship. This type of thanksgiving. That that I realize that he is the one who has changed my life. And as a response to that, I'm going to give him all of my heart. And everything that I have to express that, I'm going to give it. I'm just going to... Give it today. I don't care what anybody thinks about it. I'm just going to give it all. And the Bible tells us that that ointment ran down his head and ran down his body. And it even she began to take and anoint his feet as well. But I want you to see, she didn't say, go get me a basin. She wanted her worship to be personal. So the, the water, it wasn't going to be just fetch me some water and I'm going to go and, and do the customary act. She wanted her tears to be the water that washed his feet. It wasn't fetch me a towel. No, it, it's personal. My hair will be the towel. My body will be the basin in which my heart of gratitude and, and service to God in worship is going to be poured out in this moment. Now, there was another guy, and this other guy had invited Jesus to his house. And so Simon, who was known as a Pharisee, but how many of you know, in the Gospel of Matthew and Mark, it calls Simon, Simon the leper. So in one Gospel, he's called Simon the Pharisee. Twice, he's called Simon the leper. And again, the implications of this is huge because we need to understand the reason why probably Jesus had been invited into Simon's home is because more than likely, Simon had been healed by Jesus. But her perspective and Simon's perspective were completely different in the moment. Even though Simon had been more than likely healed by Jesus. And we know that leprosy was kind of the sin sickness of the day. You bore the stigma of leprosy when you were were separated from your family. You were separated from community life. You had to communicate that you had this disease. And if people saw you and you were around them, you had to notify them that you had leprosy. And you had to yell out and say, I'm unclean. Don't come close to me. Don't come near me. And so there's the loss of physical contact, physical touch, no hugs, no love from the family. You're, 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 you're viewing relationships from the distance. And now Jesus has radically changed your life by showing you mercy and he's healed you of leprosy. But the woman who had been immoral, her perspective was, That Jesus has radically changed my life and I've had a grace encounter and I know the joy and the blessedness of his amazing grace and the forgiveness I've received. But somehow in the heart and mind of Simon, his perspective had grown dim of what Jesus had done for him. Who should have kissed Jesus? Simon. Who should have either at least provided a basin of water for Jesus' feet so that if you're not going to wash his feet, he can at least wash his own feet himself. But at least give him a basin and a towel and some water that he can rinse his feet. 
who was supposed to provide the anointing for his, for his hair to where he could have some fragrance about him that day, maybe after being out all day and, 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 and having something that could refresh him with fresh oil. It should have been Simon. Simon should have washed his feet. Simon should have kissed him. Simon should have been the one that anointed Jesus' head with oil. But somebody had lost perspective. And another one had kept perspective. And the outcome of those two moments were, were, were totally different. And I want to lay out another little fact. I find that when I lose perspective in my worship, when anybody else does anything that expresses more devotion and more passion than me, I begin to label it as fanatical. Hmm? Yeah, it's true. People get labeled as, oh, they're just, they're just too fanatical. I don't like when they express their emotions too much. And I don't like that person because they're just too loud. Or I don't like this person because they're, you know, they're too expressive and everything else. Normally, people get labeled fanatical because they're doing something that is a little above and beyond what you are willing to give God yourself. And this was the reaction of Simon the Pharisee. When Jesus had this woman come from behind him and she begins to break open this costly ointment and the other passage of scripture, tell us the dollar amount. It was a year's wages. It represented about $50,000 worth of fragrant ointment that was broke open over Jesus' body that day. That immediately when this woman, she's weeping and crying and she's not kissing Jesus' face, but what is she kissing? She kisses his feet. I mean, this is, this is stuff of, of true humility and brokenness before God. And there, there is this, this uncommon thanksgiving that is pouring out of her life. And Simon, because he has lost perspective of who's in his house. Somehow there's been a, motion, a, a, a moment of disconnection of what Jesus did for you. Now you're better and your life is going better and you're back in your home. You've been restored to your family and things are going back to normal. But you don't understand the one that you're hosting in your own home. And he looks at her and he says to her, he says, I thought this guy was a prophet. But if he was a prophet, he would know who's touching him right now. Now I want us to go over to, to verse 40 and I'm going to close this morning by us reading the rest of this passage of Scripture. I want us to look at verse 40. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Now when Jesus says that, it's not a good day for you. I really think this was a moment after seeing this beauty of this worship, when Simon reacted to her this way, Jesus was ticked. Because there were judgments that were being made about her worship and the extravagance of her thanks, the extravagance of her worship. And so Simon was there to try to engage, to try to shut it down. And Jesus stops and he looks at him and he says, buddy, i got to say something to you. I've got something to say to you. Now, what was it that he said? And I don't have time to take and read the whole thing. But he gives him a parable about a money lender who lent, lent money to two individuals. And somebody got a $500 loan, the other a fifty. And neither one of them could pay the debt. Can we all say that together? Neither one could pay the debt. Whether it's 50 or 500, neither one could pay the debt. It says, when they both could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? And Simon answered, the one I suppose from whom he canceled the larger debt. And Jesus said to him, you have judged right, rightly. 
Then turning towards the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her head. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. Over time, and this is where I want to just leave us this morning. Over time, there is this familiarity and this attrition that I can have in my heart where I lose perspective of what Jesus has actually done for me. And when I lose that perspective, then I begin to be like Simon the Pharisee instead of Simon the Hill leper. And I begin to judge people. And I begin to compare myself with other people and going, man, they, they're really bad. And I feel pretty good about myself. If you do feel good about yourself, it's not because there's anything good about you. It's only because of the grace of God and the goodness of God that is broke into your life that gives you a sense of well-being, my brother and sister. And so my challenge for the church this morning is when we come here, I want us to every Sunday, I want us on every Monday, I want us every Tuesday to contend in this issue of our heart where we do not lose sight of what Jesus has done for us. I want springs of life. If you say, what do you want springs of life to become? I want us to be a church of not just ordinary worship, not just customary worship, not just something where we play it safe with our heart between us and God. No, I want us to walk through the doors and there is such a weight of gratitude upon us because we are sinners that have been saved by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And whether the debt was 50 or 500, it doesn't matter. It was a debt that you could not repay. It was something that you couldn't save yourself from. It was something that you couldn't do in your own strength to make your life better. That's why you're in church today. Because there was a moment in your life where you realized that you needed God. And the gospel broke into your life. And you begin to hear the song from the Spirit of God that says amazing grace how sweet that sounds that saved a wretch like me and so if I'm going to, to be a worshiper I want to be like this woman who holds nothing back from him because ultimately we need to know that Jesus is worthy of everything That's why I would go back to Cambodia again in a heartbeat. And I would do the same job all over again. Put me digging holes, filling it with rocks, putting rebar in it, mixing concrete, put it there. Because Jesus is worth it all. And if I don't see that Jesus is worth it all, then I'll begin to say, well, why do I have to do this? It was a privilege to serve orphans in Southeast Asia. Because Jesus said, if you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. And so with every one of these children, I said, Lord, let me see with your eyes. And one of the things that I want to see is I want to see your face, Jesus, in every one of these kids. And it wasn't hard to see his face in every one of those kids. He's worth it all. Was that costly? Yeah. But in light of the price he has paid, it was nothing absolutely nothing I 
I want us to stand.